As journalists, we tell stories. We don't want to be the story. But for Tara Henley, former producer at CBC Radio, she has very much become the story after she wrote about why she left the publicly funded broadcaster and what the reality is in those hallowed halls at the CBC. Tara, uh, to say that you would be brave and brazen to, to write what you wrote about why you left CBC Radio would be an understatement. Your, your piece that you recently wrote on Substack has been replayed, retweeted, shared all over the world. So let me ask you, what was it that finally hit the linchpin for you and you had to say, I can no longer do this? Well, uh, like most things, it happened slowly and then all at once. Uh, it was something that I've been grappling with for a couple of years and have been pushing back within the newsroom for, for quite a long time. Uh, I, I, I think one of the things that sort of tipped it over the edge for me was the Dave Chappelle coverage. Uh, you know, Dave Chappelle is a huge comic. He's incredibly popular. Uh, his comedy means a lot to a lot of people. And I, I didn't see that view reflected in the controversy over the Netflix special. That was one thing. Another thing was the vaccine mandates. Uh, I think that robust discussion is required on that topic. Uh, it's a massive societal change. And I, I didn't hear robust debate on that topic. Yeah. Those were two of many, many, many um, different topics that, you know, over the last couple of years. Tara, right, we've come into this sort of time in the world, this culture, we call it cancel culture or even woke culture. But so many organizations like the CBC, for example, preach this notion of diversity. But it's not just about diversity, how you look physically or what you may identify as or what your pronouns are. There's a diversity of opinion that seems to be lacking. Mm -hmm. And anyone who, of course, you know, readers of The Sun, myself included, um, that would consider ourselves to be on the more conservative side, certainly not a, a viewpoint that is often or if all at all reflected on the CBC. And one of the things, and I touch on that because one of the things you talked about in your, in your piece was that it seemed that people were more interested in how you looked versus what you had to say. Can you expand on that? I think there's some troubling trends going on right now. I think as a society, we are moving away from the, you know, Martin Luther King ideal of judge me on the content of my character instead of the color of my skin and moving to the Ibram Kendi idea that we need to look at the racial demographics in a society and then apply those demographics to um, any institution and that that is how we achieve racial justice and that that is how we achieve diversity. I don't agree with that view. And um, I think that in the media in particular, and particularly in large public institutions, there needs to be room for a massive array of views and that the focus should be on diversity of thought. Uh, I, I believe very strongly in diversity. I believe in pluralism. I believe that we have that throughout this country. And I, I think it's really important to reflect that back. And so, you know, one of, uh, I spoke in my piece about a lot of the writers and thinkers that I've interviewed over the last year. And one of them that comes to mind right now is, is Irshad Manji. And she talks a lot mm -hmm. about, we focus on the diversity of thought. We focus on diversity of perspective. And in focusing on that, we bring in a huge array of people and views. That's, that's my view on that. CBC's audiences, both in television and radio, they, they, they've not grown very much. They've sort of held steady. And of course, as all of our viewers know, they are funded to, to the tune of over $1 billion by the taxpayer. But Tara, there is a mindset and a culture and a philosophy that has really gripped CBC, not just in the radio side where you were, but overall. And I speak about this whole memo that came out or the story that came out just before the holidays talking about words that we're not supposed to use. It was widely mocked and, and, and ridiculed for the, the craziness that it is. But I'm wondering if you can peel back the curtain for us just for a moment. Is this a top-down philosophy? Is this coming from you know, middle of the road? Is it producers? Is it editors? Where is this push for this whole notion 
of either wokeness or certainly only presenting one um, viewpoint? Where is it coming from? It's a difficult thing to unpack. Uh, you know, I will say that this is a massive service. There are a lot of people doing really incredible work. There are a lot of colleagues really fighting for good journalism in the building. And mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really important to say that. My sense of what's going on is that it is top down. And, you know, I, I had that sense uh, going into this week and that really has been confirmed. I can't tell you how many messages I have gotten from people in the building this week supporting the fact that I'm speaking about this and starting this conversation. People are very concerned about the direction that the service is going. So it's just important to know that there are very good people there as well and there's good mm -hmm. work being done. But uh, I, I think you're right in characterizing it as a sort of gripped by ideology right now. And I don't think that's healthy. I think the woke view is important to have in the room. I, I'm happy to hear that. I'm always happy to reflect it. I don't think it can be the only voice in the mm -hmm. room. You do reflect upon the fact that you are, you know, the the ardent leftist often in a news meeting. And when you're having these discussions and you you sort of looked around and, and thought, how how is it that, uh, you know, your viewpoint, your own philosophical views have have shifted and probably adjusted to the very notion uh, that your your notion of good journalism wasn't being reflected. How is that? How did that change for you? It's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, my views are very consistent. I am far left. I am pro working class. I, I you know, I'm pro racial justice. I am pro trans rights. I am all of those things. Um, I think the important thing is that there are kind of massive societal changes that are happening right now. And there are very many views on how we get there and how we go about this. And so while I am very far left, I have always read a lot of people across the political spectrum. I have always interviewed conservatives and centrists and libertarians and heterodox thinkers and you know contrarian leftists. There are many, many views on these big issues of our age. And you know, while there is broad societal consensus on some things, it's not the Twitter consensus. And I think that what's happening in most of media right now, aside from the financial incentives that polarize us, there is also this idea that what's happening on Twitter is what's happening in the public. And those of us that report know that that is just not accurate. I think I recall infamously the former opinion page ed editor at the New York Times quit for that very reason. She, in her resignation statement, said when the New York Times decides that Twitter is no longer the arbiter of what should be on their pages, you know, journalism will be much better off. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but yeah. it's, it's akin to what, what you're referring to in terms of what's happening in our industry. And there's such a great distrust. If we, even we could go back to the election of President Donald Trump. Um, yes, certainly he stoked a lot of the of media, the fires against the media, you know, fake news, this, that, and the other thing. But there was an element of truth to what he was saying with respect to you cannot believe and trust everything that is being said, because if that was the case, then Hillary Clinton would be president, would have been president uh, six years ago. But uh, this is this is sort of an industry wide uh, crisis that is happening. And, and there is a significant part of the population, not just in Canada and the United States, but, but represented globally, that is being missed from the conversation. And that is in part what I feel is, is giving rise to these you know, these alt ideas and these sub, you know, organizations that, you know, kind of attract not necessarily the best of characters, but it's it's in part because in legacy media, mainstream media is leaving them out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so much to unpack there. I, I agree that there's a huge portion of the population being left out. And I think one of the important constituencies that's being left out is the working class. And that's a massive part of the population. And, you know, there's interesting work on this. I mean, there's part of what's happened in our profession is it used to be a working class profession. And now uh, our 
profession is mainly highly educated, affluent elites. And that is a very specific perspective. It is not a perspective that's shared by everyone. There's room for that perspective, but we need to start listening more. We need to start talking to more people. And I, you know, the, it's interesting that you bring up 2016 because that was a huge moment. That was a major miss for us in the media. We did not see that coming. You also brought up the idea of a backlash, you know, that, that sometimes when you ignore a big pop part of the population and, and silence a big part of the population, you get a backlash. I don't want to mm-hmm. see that kind of backlash. So I think it's important to have these conversations. They're happening everywhere. I talk to people about this all the time. They're not happening in public. They need to happen in public. Mm-hmm. You brought up Barry Weiss and Barry Weiss is someone that I really admire and respect when her resignation letter came out. It had a huge impact on me and I have watched her at Substack have an actual robust discussion about these issues, Mm -hmm. have a wide range of views to say the things that are currently off the table to be talked about in mainstream press. We need to start talking about these things. You talk about backlash and you talk about reaction. Has CBC reacted or responded to your criticisms? I did see that the CBC responded uh, in a statement. Um, And I think that it's also interesting that I've heard a lot of response from from the building, from my colleagues, overwhelmingly positive. And it's been pretty incredible to get that feedback and support. Well, we certainly know this is not going to be the last we hear from you, Tara Henley. And we know you're writing another book. So what's next for you? Uh, I'm going to be writing on Substack. I will be doing my podcast and, you know, interviewing authors with a broad range of ideas from across the political spectrum. And my next book is called Things Fall Apart. So we will go from there. We look forward to having you back in another conversation about these very important issues. Thank you so very much. Log on to Facebook and Twitter. Let us know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you can click the link below to read Tara Henley's blog post.